Good morning, everybody. We've got a great crowd here. Thank you for joining us in the first session of the day. Appreciate it. Just um, want to make sure this is transcripting. Is it working? I, 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 test, 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 test. It's like karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is, um, this is the first annual session, I guess you would say, of the Dynamic Coalition on DNS Issues. Um, and I think I might just... Hello? Can... Transcript, transcript. Okay. We'll just wait, we'll just wait a few minutes. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead. <laughs> uh, so good morning and welcome to the 2019 session of the Dynamic Coalition on DNS Issues. My name is Susan Chalmers and I work in the Office of International Affairs for NTIA or the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Uh, NTIA is an agency at the US uh, Department of Commerce, and we do a great many things, but most relevant to this discussion here, uh, we, lead for, we are the lead for DNS policy within the US government, and we strongly support the multi-stakeholder approach in the IGF. Uh, so just a little bit of background on uh, why we formed the Dynamic Coalition last year. Um, so in the early days of the IGF, domain name issues almost always found their way into the discussion, and a good number of colleagues from the DNS community were engaged. Over time, the internet governance landscape evolved, issues evolved, and we noticed that uh, fewer folks from the DNS community were attending the IGF. So if you accept the fact that uh, multi-stakeholder discussion is enriched to the extent that is formed by a diversity of perspectives, um, then, well, part of our intent in starting up the DC on DNS issues was to encourage deeper participation from the DNS community in the IGF and also to encourage greater discussion within the IGF community on DNS issues. Importantly, though, we should note that the work of the coalition is scoped in a way to complement, but not to uh, duplicate or conflict with work undertaken at ICANN or at the IETF. Um, so we have launched this coalition last year uh, with Verisign um, and Affilius. Um, and uh, throughout the year, we've had the extreme pleasure of working with a group of knowledgeable and passionate people over the DC DNSI mailing list. And I would like to think that discussions over the past year have been useful to different people in various ways. So during our inaugural year as a dynamic coalition, the community showed great interest in universal acceptance. And so that is what this session is about. What can be done to advance universal acceptance, which itself uh, serves to advance digital inclusion? And what in particular can be done to advance UA readiness within the public sector? So it is my great pleasure to welcome our key speakers today, who will help us break new ground on this nascent policy issue. And we have uh, Chris Despain, Vice Chair of the ICANN Board of Directors, um, Mark Semkarik from Microsoft, 
Emily Ta Taylor, CEO of Oxford Information Labs and the leading author of the URID UNESCO World Report on IDNs. Manal Ismail, uh, Chair of the ICANN Governmental Advisory Group and Director of the International Technical Coordination Department at the National Telecommunications Regulatory Authority of Egypt. Liana Gaussian, External um, Relations Manager for ISAC Armenia. Constance Berger, uh, Information Technology Specialist at the German Federal Ministry of the Interior. Edmund Chung, <laughs> there you are. Edmund Chung, uh, CEO of the Dot Asia organization. Ram Mohan, Executive Vice President and CTO of Avilius. And last but certainly not least, um, Dr. Jay Data, Managing Director of Data Group of Industries and Chair of the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. And Dr. Data will be uh, joining us remotely later on. So we have about 80 minutes. This session will have four basic parts. First, we'll hear about the venues where universal acceptance is being discussed. Second, we'll hear about why universal acceptance is important. Third, we'll discuss how universal acceptance is faring within the public sector. And fourth, we'll wrap things up and discuss whether uh, the dynamic coalition should continue work on this topic next year or uh, choose something else. Um, so I would like to suggest that we begin by inviting Chris to explain how UA readiness may figure into ICANN's work in the coming year. And Chris, if you wouldn't mind explaining what universal acceptance is. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my job today is to talk about universal acceptance in the context of, of, of ICANN and why we think it's important and why it's uh, uh, an integral part of our new five-year strategic plan. Um, we think it's a, it's a foundational requirement for a, a, a truly multilingual internet, and it's the key to unlocking the potential of, of internationalized domain names, um, a subject that's very close to my heart. But also new GTLDs, it's not just about IDNs, it's also about new GTLDs. The landscape since 2006 um, in the domain name system has obviously markedly changed. There are now more than 1,200 TLDs, uh, including internationalized uh, TLDs in, uh, in various different scripts, in Cyrillic and Chinese and Arabic and so on, and a number of new GTLDs that are not three letters long. They're longer words, um, uh, such as you know, .paris or, or .college. But the majority of, of internet-enabled applications were created more than 20 years ago, and so many of those applications and systems don't recognize or appropriately deal with um, a string that is either not in ASCII or is longer than two or three characters. And obviously, that's, solving that issue and getting that sorted out is incredibly important um, because universal acceptance of domain names and email addresses um, is, is the key to unlocking the internet for uh, the billions of users who don't have, um, don't use languages that, um, has, uh, that have ASCII scripts uh, or for people who want to access GTLDs in ASCII that are, uh, have longer, uh, that are longer strings. So I can, understanding and realizing the fundamental and significant nature of the challenge um, has made universal acceptance part of the strategic plan, and I'll just read what it says in the plan. It says, a unique identifier system, strategic goal, foster competition, consumer choice, and innovation in the internet space by increasing awareness and encouraging readiness for universal acceptance, IDN implementation, and IPv6. So it, it's, a, it's a combined goal, but universal acceptance and IDN implementation feature very strongly in there. And we've expanded the oversight role to include um, universal acceptance, and we've done that by forming uh, the universal acceptance uh, working group, the board's universal acceptance working group, um, which is a, a, a group on the board that obviously concentrates on that issue. Uh, and a UA program is being set, set up within ICANN.org to identify and engage with relevant stakeholders globally to make the software applications and email systems UA ready. 
So I know that Mark is going to talk about what the steering group does, and it's probably best at this point if I pass it across to you, Mark, and you go into the details. Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Swanzerich from uh, Microsoft, and I'm part of the leadership team of the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Uh, the Universal Acceptance Steering Group was created four years ago, and we've been working to um, ensure, as Chris said, that all domain names and all email addresses um, work equivalently on all software and services. Um, we're trying something somewhat new. We're more integrated now with uh, the ICANN organization than we were before. Uh, we've created an uh, ICANN-style action plan, and we've uh, reorganized ourselves into a collection of working groups. Uh, we're still, our mission is still the same. Uh, our stakeholders are still generally the same. That is um, technology enablers, technology developers, email providers, influencing individuals and organizations and government policymakers. But the way that we define and focus on them is uh, somewhat more refined. Uh, we've split ourselves into five uh, working groups. There's a technology working group uh, ensuring that uh, code is written correctly and developers know what to do. Uh, an email working group, uh, which is focusing on uh, correct adoption of internationalized email addresses. Uh, a measurement group, so that we can track uh, what our, our current baseline is and um, what sort of progress we're making. A communications group, we've always had a communications group, but now it's much more tightly integrated uh, with the ICANN resources, which gives us um, uh, more resources. And then finally, local initiatives. We have a local initiatives team that now also works more closely with uh, the local ICANN resources. Um, but we have our own ambassador program. We currently have seven ambassadors uh, in various geographies who are creating content and reaching out to um, universities, governments, um, and businesses. Um, we have an action plan that you can review. It's on uasg.tech. Um, in the grand tradition of ICANN, UASG.tech is actually kind of hard to navigate and find anything on, but Mark Datisgeld is, uh, is working to revise the structure of it so that it's easier to use and find things on. So you can, you can see what our action plan is and uh, the plans of the various working groups there. Anything else? Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so now we all know where the uh, pertinent discussions are happening and where the work is being uh, undertaken. Does anybody have any questions at this point? No? Nope. Okay. Well, I think we should move ahead and um, uh, kind of explore why UA readiness, universal acceptance readiness is so important. And to do, to do this, I'd like to turn uh, to Emily Taylor. Uh, uh, we have some slides here. Um, so Emily, please, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you also for inviting myself and Giovanni Sepia to participate in this very important session at the IGF. Um, I'm just going to take you through some highlights of this year's report, which is launched today. Um, and it's giving a wider context to the uptake of internationalized domain names. The um, IDN report is a partnership effort. It is uh, by URID, UNESCO, and Verisign, um, and also the CCTLD organizations who all uh, participate, uh, help to fund it, and share data uh, through the years. So, key facts and figures, there are 9 million IDNs uh, measured at December 2018. That's actually a 20% increase, which seems really exciting, but a lot of the difference between the 2017 and 2018 figures is the availability of data from China. So, uh, the Chinese registry um, uh, no longer publish their IDN data, and so we've been, uh, but we did get um, data for the Dot um, uh, uh TLD. So, um, of the um, 9 million IDNs, nearly 4 million are 
located in China, which really highlights different registration patterns to what we see in um, traditional domain names, but still less than 3% of the world's domains are IDNs. And when we're talking about universal acceptance, you can see that there is a huge potential for IDNs, but at the moment that potential is not being fulfilled in registration numbers. Um, but there are lots and lots of really good things about IDNs when they are being used. So um, the, the world map that you can see on this slide uh, looks at the, uh, the script of IDNs. And what we see, you know, whether it's Cyrillic script in Russia or Han script in China or Arabic script across the Middle East and North Africa, that where you have a script that is strongly associated with a geographical region, that's where you find IDNs in that script. Um, and also the script of IDNs very strongly signals the language that you're going to find on web content associated with that domain name. These are not random patterns. So when you see, say, a Cyrillic script domain name, you will tend to see Russian, Bulgarian, uh, Arabic script associated with Arabic, Persian, and so on. These are not random. Where IDNs are in use, they are really helping internet users to know what sort of language they're going to find on web pages. That's great. Great. We looked this year, we've been um, uh, honing our, um, our methodologies on identifying parking pages. That's quite of interest to the industry as a whole. And unfortunately, when we're looking at the GTLDs, uh, the generic top level domains, um, the IDNs, we're finding that 81% of them are parked. Again, bringing us back to the topic of this session, why are so few of them in active use or in really uh, strong use? It's probably because using them is still problematic. It's still difficult to send and uh, receive emails. It's still, you know, it, the, web, um, the, the web situation is better, but it's still unpredictable. The, 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 the two blocks um, on the other side, just very briefly, what we've done with the EU uh, internationalized domain names is we've looked at the language of web content before and after eliminating parking pages. And the big dark blue blob on the left-hand side almost disappears, and that is English language. So what we say is parking pages are more likely to be in English language than, uh, uh, and you get a much more uh, even spread of um, linguistically diverse content uh, right across the board once you get rid of parking. We're going to be talking much more and we have really um, very, very uh, uh, knowledgeable partners here in the room talking about progress on universal acceptance. It's something that our researchers look at each year and what we're finding is, you know, there's good news and bad news, right? Uh, browsers, generally, the, the experience is improving each year. This year, a big change we saw is that the support in mobile browsers is much more predictable, much better. And that's usually because the mobiles are, are using more traditional browsers, more up-to-date browsers, and just pulling them across. But when we're thinking about Internet of Things and embedded devices, where they're doing their own thing and creating their own browsers, usually they don't support um, internationalized domain names at all. Where they embed traditional browsers uh, and up-to-date browsers, it's a good news story. So this speaks to the, the, the value of shared software libraries that support IDNs. Um, Sending and receiving emails, well, we've heard from Mark, Google supporting um, IDNs. We will hear from Dr. Data. There's some really good news um, and good progress on internationalized um, email, sending and receiving. But these are like islands that are not yet joined up. If you are not on one of those services or if you encounter a, a, a piece of infrastructure that does not support <laughs> internationalized domain names, sorry, it doesn't work. 
And the one area which is really frustrating and where we see no progress year on year is using these unique email addresses, which are guaranteed to be unique, as user identifiers. That's how most people log into popular applications, and still it's flatlining. And one of the interesting aspects of research that was found about by a, a piece of ICANN research this year is that um, HTML5 is not supporting um, internationalized email addresses. That's an inexplicable oversight. And so it's not actually validating that input as a proper email address. This year is UNESCO's International Year of Indigenous Languages. And to help them to uh, celebrate that, uh, we have, um, uh, thanks to the support of URID, we have done a, a report on the experience of European indig indigenous language populations in using their languages online. And we've built that up through interviews with the Sami community, with the Greco, Greco community, and with Catalan community a widely spoken uh, indigenous language. And so you've got a, a very large, medium and small size language. So I do recommend that report to you. We also do find in our IDNs, when we look at the quantitative side, that we do see Irish, we see Maori, we see Welsh, and we see uh, other indigenous languages represented in the web content. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, Giovanni Sepia just for the last slides looking at the experience of .eu and IDNs. Thank you, Emily. Uh, very quickly and very briefly, um, 13 days ago we launched .eu in Greek um, and uh, we are happy to report that uh, uh, it exceeded our expectation, the number of registrations so far, because uh, um, could be seen as a small number because we have so far 500 brand new um, Greek registrations under the in Greek, but 500 in 13 days compared to um, you know, the experience of other IDNs, especially in the CCTLD world, um, that's quite a high uh, volume of registrations and the number is growing. And we also heard that uh, um, our Greek uh, uh, TLD colleagues, they also are experiencing uh, quite high volume registrations for Epsilon Lambda, which is uh, uh, their IDN correspondent for uh, .gr in uh, ASCII. Um, so um, we have been supporting uh, all the um, scripts uh, of the 24 official European Union languages uh, um, since 2009. And uh, in 2016, we have launched the .u in Cyrillic, uh, 13 days ago the .u in Greek, uh, and we have been uh, investigating uh, with Emily Oxil and uh, all the partners of the URID UNESCO uh, World Report uh, the correlation between uh, the language and uh, uh, the language of uh, website content associated to uh, a domain name in uh, uh, Greek or in Cyrillic. Um, and uh, we have noticed, uh, as Emily was saying, that there is a correlation. So if there is a, a website linked to a domain name in uh, um, Cyrillic or in Greek, uh, chances that the content is uh, in that language are uh, quite high. And, and uh, that you can see in, in this slide. So um, I leave the summary to Emily. But uh, again, the main point I wanted to highlight is really that we are happy to report that uh, the .eu in Greek uh, registrations are going well. And this shows there is an interest in IDNs uh, and uh, that IDNs are really uh, enabling um, certain communities uh, to be present on the internet and, and um, do have their language uh, on the internet. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Um, we are asked by you, Susan, to, to describe why universal acceptance is important. And I hope that this very brief overview of our research highlights the fact that there is a clear potential that IDNs enable a more multilingual internet, which Chris highlighted as one of ICANN's aims. And yet, if they're not able to be used in a predictable way, then the uptake will be, it will be stifled. And it will never reach that potential. And what you're doing is forcing other language communities to use things that do support their languages, like social media, which support their languages beautifully. And so the domain name system really has to be on catch-up. 
You can see the summaries on the slides, but this is the, the key point that I would want us to be discussing and reflecting upon in this, in this environment, is how do we make it more of a priority? Universal acceptance progress is great, but it is slow, and when you compare it to the sort of uh, finance that's being put in in, say, AI or blockchain, this is very much the poor relation, and it should not be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily Giovanni, um, and, and for your insights, your research insights, for sharing those with us. Um, and does anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, Melinda. Thanks, Giovanni. I was wondering if you're doing anything different in terms of marketing and promotion uh, with the Greek uh, TLD than you do with other TLDs, with .eu, for example. Um, thank you. It's, it's a very interesting question. So in terms of what we have been doing so far is to um, approach registrars in uh, the Greek and uh, Bulgarian region to um, try to help them to promote uh, um, the .eu in Cyrillic and in Greek. And uh, um, we have been uh, in contact with several, uh, um, let's say, uh, providers of email solutions to make sure that emails are um, universally accepted whenever there is a, a uh, .u in Greek or .u in Cyrillic domain name registered. Um, I must say that uh, the response from uh, local registrars uh, is quite poor. And the reason is because uh, there is a lack of demand from their customers. Uh, and, and therefore, and also because uh, um, um, they do have to invest uh, quite a lot of resources. Uh, and, and because the demand is poor, um, it's not a priority in their list. But we, we are not giving up. Um, we have several meetings planned um, with those registrars again, and, and we count to, to have uh, more promotion of the IDNs, especially at the top level now, uh, in the coming months. I think we have um, a question from this gentleman and then Edmund. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Andreas, um, Honest Consulting. Um, there's just one risk that I actually see, um, and this is the risk of isolation. Um, if I look at domains in Greek, for example, um, with an English keyboard, I have no chance to visit that website. So there should be some kind of an, yeah, translation mechanism or whatever, um, so, or maybe some kind of a policy that when I register uh, a domain with a specific character that is not an ASCII character, that I register a second domain that is somehow in translation of that. Because if I just focus on very small businesses in a local country, that's fine, because a bakery would like to get uh, um, an accountant in the same city and they are speaking the same language, but maybe this is an, a bakery that is making the best cake or pancakes or whatever on the planet, and I would like to buy them and they have an online shop, I have no chance to buy that stuff. So this is just, a, it's not really a question, it's more like a comment that we are in a, in a situation where we have to make a good choice um, if we don't isolate specific parts of the DNS world from each other. Thank you. I think that's an interesting com uh, comment. And we uh, threw out the, this is Edmund Chung from .asia, sorry. Um, and we received that uh, quite often over the years. Uh, I think it's, a, it's interesting. I won't touch on that. I think we'll come back to some of that discussion. But I have one quick question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the internationalized email address uh, has kind of, a, the progress has flatlined. Um, I wonder how, what, what the, what the uh, methodology uh, has been using. One of the things that um, I guess at the uh, UASG we have been looking at is the, uh, is the acceptance of uh, uh, email address internationalization at the server level, and that seems to be uh, growing a little bit, um, not necessarily, you know, yeah, uh, fully fully aware, but I um, wonder what the what the methodology is and how, how that leads to the the, uh, the the results. Thank you very much, Edmund. Um, just a quick clarification: I'm not saying that email EAI has flatlined its progress on accepting emails as 
identify a sign-in, logins for, for popular applications. That's what I'm talking about. You can read our methodology um, in, in the pages of the universal acceptance aspects, which, which highlights all of the, uh, the different things that we're looking at the, across the browsers. No, in fact, uh, this year we're reporting you know, good progress, which will be familiar. We've heard from Mark, we've heard from Dr. Data. There's good progress on the major email providers, but also this very interesting project that um, XGen are doing in India, which is showing that where, where it works and where it's available, people really do use it. Um, if I may, could I just make a quick comment on your very interesting observation about the risks of isolation? I think I, I view it as a spectrum, you know, where you have total linguistic diversity. Yes, each of those languages will be a pocket which is talking to each other. That's at one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is a monoculture where there is one language, one script. I think we're probably in the DNS, we're a bit closer to that, uh, that end of the spectrum. And so I think we could healthily uh, incorporate more diversity in the DNS without getting close to the risks that you're describing. Uh, there, are, there are ways that, you know, one of the wonderful things about the internet is that it brings to be people together across uh, geographical and linguistic boundaries. I don't expect that to stop, but just as Europe uh, has many languages which coexist without any of them being degraded, that diversity is something that we're at risk of losing if we don't make more effort to support it in the DNS, in my opinion. Manol, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, um, uh, thank you, Susan. Actually, it's not a question. It's more of a comment uh, to confirm what Emily um, uh, said earlier. So, um, actually, in practice, we had our IDN CCTLD uh, launched, and a, a few days later, we had like 3,500 registrations. But then the majority of those registrations are parked, as, as Emily mentioned. And in fact, the, the, the number became static. So no further registrations because the emails are not working smoothly. And afterwards, this number is even declining now with people not renewing the registration. So just to confirm Emily's uh, uh, findings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ram, and then uh, we'll circle back, uh, Manal, uh, to you for the next section on why um, UA is an important. Uh, Ram. Thank you, Susan. This is Ram Mohan. Um, further to what um, both Emily and, and Manal have, have said, um, what we're seeing here is evidence that me the mere presence uh, or access to IDN domain names uh, or to EAI uh, is not sufficient. You know, if you look at success and the definition of success in the in the DNS uh, space, success uh, it really ought to be defined not by the number of domain names that have been registered, but rather by the amount of content that is actually accessible and whether such accessibility is possible. And as the gentleman there earlier intervened, even getting to these domain names on your browser or in a registration system uh, is a challenge. And, and so I think it very neatly highlights um, the reason why universal acceptance is, is the real issue rather than IDNs or uh, just domain names themselves. Thank you. I'd like to, oh, yep, one, uh, one more intervention and then we'll We'll go back to our speakers, please. Okay, uh, I will thank you, I would like to bring a bit of the local experience from Serbia, where we uh, implemented uh, Serbian.serb uh, Cyrillic uh, uh, TLD. And uh, in Serbia, uh, we are using both Cyrillic and Latin script, and mostly on the internet is used Latin script, so Serbian uh, TLD was implemented but uh, the main name number of the regi registrations was ne not very big. But my point is that it is also about branding and how do you market the domain names. Because in Serbian case, at the beginning, it has been decided that the price for the Cyrillic uh, domain will be just one dinner. It's like one euro cent. 
so it was very cheap and the number took off because registrars were giving away those. And uh, later when uh, price was increased, but still it is cheaper than normal .rs, as, uh, CCTLD, uh, the number went down. Uh, also, uh, because people didn't really see the value, because the price was in the beginning so low, so the uh, perception of the market was those that those domain names are less valued than the regular uh, US ASCII ones. So in a way, it's not only about how to set up uh, technology, in, it is, but incentives on the marketplace could be something that can create perceptions that are in fact, not very well effective in the long run. Thank you. Okay. Um, first, we'll we'll go to Mark and then to um, Leonid, I believe. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm actually going to backtrack a little bit to the the comment about isolation. Uh, thinking about how email works, uh, when you describe EAI. You know, email that uses non-ASCII characters, and people say, well, how can I use that? I don't have that keyboard, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the point is, well, then that feature is not for you. And so that is an isolating statement. Um, however, if you think about the alternative, then the isolation is not so bad. So, um, imagine, so I have uh, Bengali, and, and Hindi email addresses, and I have to admit, I cannot tell them apart. So imagine people who speak one language, read one language, recognize one script. If you ask them to use ASCII, it will be unintelligible gibberish to them. And if you're trying to create um, confidence in the internet, you know, confidence that this email is from the Department of Transportation, from my tax authority, from my doctor, and it's just a bunch of unrecognizable characters. They really can't be confident in that. Uh, when they receive an email from someone and it's um, in, in Latin characters, they can't be confident that it's the actual person, um, you know, until it gets in their address book, I suppose. Um, so it, in regard to isolation of email, just remember that, that we're trying to empower some people who really can't use the Latin script in any meaningful way, not in any way that is, um, provides confidence of security. So in that regard, I think that it's, it's fine. We still have the marketing problem that people don't realize they have this option at all, and that's where the experiment that Dr. Dada is doing in India um, could prove my point to be true. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Uh, for the record, Leonid Turner of LPT, um, EPTLD. Well, I must admit that uh, I was skeptical about uh, uh, IDNs from the very onset, and I, I'm, I'm, I still am. Uh, and I'm not alone. I mean, John Clanson is equally skeptical, if uh, not to say, if just to say the least. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, uh, I would certainly pick on what Ram said and uh, Danko. I believe that uh, the greatest uh, challenge is marketing. And uh, uh, we have a saying uh, from one of the most famous and most hilarious books in, in the Soviet literature, the saving of the drowning is in the hands of the drowning. Uh, which means that, yes, no, no one else but ourselves can do something about that. And uh, I'm happy to let you know that as a real opportunist, I jumped on that bandwagon by uh, suggesting uh, to our members and non-members uh, to create a very special, to establish a very special task force, uh, an ad hoc task force, uh, to uh, try uh, to experiment uh, uh, as uh, Laos is uh, still awaiting uh, the delegation of uh, its uh, uh, IDN. It would be a very nice opportunity for uh, the APTLD community to come together and to try to develop a, a very uh, special marketing plan, which, uh, or roadmap, if you will, which uh, over time uh, might be uh, uh, some kind of universal uh, blueprint for new and old IDNs on the route. So we are working on this. We are hoping uh, that we would be able to unveil uh, the uh, outcome because this is a very collaborative effort involving some uh, uh, 
some people here at the table. So let's hope that we will uh, be able to uh, encompass uh, all the challenges and all the opportunities and reflect uh, them on them in uh, our blueprint. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for this dynamic exchange during our dynamic coalition. <laughs> session. Um, so I'd like to uh, move on to the next part of our session that really kind of explores the value <clears throat> of, of UA. Um, Manal, would you like to um, start? And then Liana uh, can provide us some reflections from a session that was held on UA at, at CDIG. Manal, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Susan, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, um, in terms of um, universal acceptance, as, as we've already said, it's not only IDNs, it's even new GTLDs, so it's basically important uh, for, uh, for everyone uh, and not only uh, IDNs, but speaking um, explicitly about um, IDNs and from a governmental perspective as well, um, I would say there are several uh, parts to this, so the use of the official language of, of the country is basic to, uh, to governments and also to reach out to all citizens irrespective whether they know a foreign language um, or not. Also this uh, would um, increase uh, internet penetration uh, at a national level and um, uh, definitely bridging um, also digital divide, uh, preserving the cultural uh, identity um, of the country, um, and promoting meaningful participation as well. Um, and um, um, also for governments, I think it's sometimes interesting to have, uh, for example, their equipment or their um, uh, tenders or, or uh, uh, future proof, I mean, uh, requesting this as a condition in their procurement uh, uh, tenders would be also um, something I think they would be keen to have uh, to purchase something that's uh, future proof. Um, I'm sure also universal acceptance has its very direct and obvious uh, benefits to the end user, of course, uh, but also I also believe it, it has its own uh, benefits even to the private sector. It's, it's more uh, market, uh, reaching out to more uh, market uh, and, and more users. Um, also, with, with the digital inclusion on, as a priority on most of the government's agendas, uh, and, and with, when we talk about digital inclusion, we're saying that uh, we need to include um, everyone, and, and including uh, 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 indigenous uh, uh, communities. Uh, we need them to have access to, to um, uh, internet and, and, and um, ICT in general and to have the skills to use uh, those technologies uh, to, to benefit from uh, the digital world and be part of the digital world. So it's, it's only uh, sensible that governments would be interested to have uh, more uh, citizens online and part of, of uh, this uh, digital world and make sure we're not leaving anyone behind uh, when we talk about uh, digital inclusion. Uh, so I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much. And I know um, there are a lot of experts in the room who are steeped in this, and especially from the technical side, but it's important that, uh, and especially in the IGF context, that we understand why uh, UA is important to, one of the main themes to digital inclusion this year. So thank you, Manal, for that. Um, Liana, would you like to take the floor? Thank you very much, Liana Galstan. Uh, I will talk about, uh, on behalf of the uh, Southeastern European IGF, which is the CDIC. Uh, the, at CDIC, uh, given the diversity of scripts uh, in the region, we uh, tend to have this session uh, about IDNs. Um, since uh, the existence of CDIC so for all five years, we've discussed different topics and different angles. 
uh, about the IDNs. So for uh, this year, we uh, co-organized a session. Sorry, Liana, I just don't know if you have it off the top of your head, but how many different scripts are in are in the region? Uh, I would say we last, uh, mostly use Cyrillic in the region uh, because many countries uh, in the Balkan countries using the Cyrillic script. We do have Armenian, Georgian, Greek. So the, the, the region is uh, different and indigenous uh, in their scripts as well, like, Cyril, uh, like Georgian and Armenian, mostly and uh, Greek as well. Thank you. Still. Uh, so this year we organized uh, a session uh, which is co-organized actually with the um, DC and uh, DNSI uh, colleagues and uh, the effort was to bring uh, to the discussion governmental representatives of our countries and also the CCTLD operators to see how we can advance the multilingualism uh, on the internet and uh, see them how the policies can be changed uh, in order to promote this uh, IDNs and uh, multilingual approach there. So what we have discussed, uh, we had the governmental representatives uh, from Bulgaria. The, the situation in Bulgaria is not a good uh, in sense that the, themselves, the operators, uh, IDN operators and ASCII operators, they are making some uh, changes and um, the government wants to collaborate with them and uh, bring uh, into the discussion and coordinate the work that they've been doing. Uh, well, the champions uh, in sense of Cyrillic script uh, is of course Russia. We know they may be the second highest popular uh, script IDN uh, registration after the Chinese is uh, Russian in Cyrillic and uh, Russia is doing a champion work and uh, I see colleagues uh, from Russian uh, CCTLD registry here and uh, they, they, at our session they're sharing the experience and um, we saw that that um, increase and um, popularity maybe because of the support by the government itself. So they are highly promoting and collaborating with the CCTLD operator to make uh, it uh, usable within the, world, in, in the country. Uh, then uh, we had a discussion how we can promote and uh, Danko here mentioned the Serbian registry and their um, experience. I would say that uh, Serbia is doing really good in uh, terms of um, making it popular within the country and especially the, lately the registry uh, accepted a policy that they would support the, uh, mine, the, for the scripts of minority uh, nationalities that have been uh, recognized in the country. So all those minority uh, nationalities can use their own scripts uh, within the registry of IDN, which I think really great initiative in the country. Uh, for the uh, Armenian perspective, I would say that it's not, uh, we do not also have many registrations, as Manal mentioned, uh, in the country. From the beginning, we had a little bit more, but uh, those were at the beginning, uh, mostly the uh, public sector uh, registrations. Later on, uh, for quite a long time, we had a even uh, n not growing uh, number of registrations. But now, now we uh, collaborate uh, again with the um, government, mostly the language committee, and we want to promote it uh, in, the, in the schools and in the uh, educational system. And uh, we even as a CCTLD registry, we proposed uh, to give uh, for all the educational uh, institutions and schools uh, the domain names in the IDN domain names for free of charge. But um, here we came uh, to, to face the challenge of not only marketing, but also the, um, as we see the growth of social media. So the problem of those people do not having the domain name itself. So when we are proposing domain names, the IDNs to, to, to the schools, like 
we're giving you this for free of charge, and we're talking with the staff, they said, but do you provide us the hosting? Do you give us, will you give us help uh, construct the website and maintain it, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, if you're not doing that, we do not have staff or people doing it. So it's easier for us to take the social media platform for marketing, what we're doing about our activities. So it's, it's another topic, actually, of bringing the problems of domain name registration itself, so it, it brings with it uh, its, its own challenges, taking a part of the IDN issue. But uh, still the IDN um, is uh, better advancing now in uh, Armenia because of this collaboration with the language committee and we try to do that to, to bring it to the uh, government itself. And there was a discussion actually that uh, if the government uh, uh, the, the public sector, they um, themselves use uh, the, the domain names, all the official um, websites and official domains will be in, in the IDN, in the national script, then uh, the public, the, the community themselves will use it as well. So the, all the public sector um, publicity and the um, promotion will be in that level. Uh, and also there was an interesting case of Georgia where we've been talking uh, at, at that session that there is a mandatory um, uh, thing uh, of translating all the products that uh, importing or exporting it should be uh, it should have the uh, script in uh, in Georgian I mean all the things that um, is related to the product. And in this analog, uh, they want to bring this policy that the IDNs, uh, the domain names, should be by, by mandatory uh, given for all the organizations. So those who are registering the organizations, they should have their domain names and the IDN domain names. So IDNs practically, which is, uh, I think, a good initiative and that could make it popular within the country as well. So this was the, basically the discussions that we have, and uh, that was a good uh, attempt of bringing the governmental representatives and uh, the, the technical community and to see how we can collaborate uh, and bring the value to this multilingual internet and include everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liana, and I think that is a perfect segue uh, into the next portion of our discussion, which is going to look at um, the role of the government in particular uh, and um, the different ways that it can promote UA readiness. Um, for our first speaker in this section, uh, Ram, I'd like to, to ask you to take the floor. Please, thank you. Thank you, Susan, for um, organizing this uh, really important session. Um, governments are clearly a key group in driving universal acceptance. Um, there are a couple of things to, to think about. First, um, if you look at the mission of many governments, uh, their missions include advancing digital inclusion as well as integrating linguistic diversity. Those points have already been made. Um, but there is another thing. Governments also have an ongoing responsibility to allow and to enable their citizens uh, to access the internet through websites and URLs, regardless of the language or the length of, of these websites and, and these URLs, these domain names, right? So that's, there is an access um, uh, responsibility as well. And, um, it just reminds me of, of the, the Greek mathematician Archimedes uh, who said, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. Uh, I think governments have a tremendous opportunity, particularly in, in the area of procurement um, for various contracts and various um, uh, things that they do to, to specify universal acceptance and UA readiness as, a, as an important criterion um, in the qualification um, for various parties um, that come to the table. Now, that is not regulation. Uh, what that is is uh, in the area of incentives uh, to industry um, to, to get to the table, and it aligns with the, the mission that governments have um, of inclusion, et cetera. Now, there are a couple of other things. We know that, uh, or we should know, 
that the problem that is being looked at here on universal acceptance is not a technical problem. The problem really uh, on universal acceptance is one of coordination and collaboration uh, between many diverse players in the ICT spectrum. Uh, these are far-flung um, institutions, and uh, having just one specific message or having a group like DNSI or UASG or ICANN or ITF, uh, they are not sufficient to actually get these messages across. Um, so if you really look at um, how do you... Um, how should we view universal acceptance? I think there are really two lenses to look at it. From the point of view of those of us who are involved with the domain name system, with the operation, with the management, um, or with the coordination of the domain name system, uh, we ought to look at it in terms of utility, um, relevance, and legitimacy um, for cyberspace itself. So that is, a, that is one lens to look at. From the government's perspective, however, I would suggest that the lens to look at might be the lens of inclusion, integration, trust, and access um, to the citizenry that whom they are um, required and, and there to serve. Um, and if you look at those two lenses, I, I think you'll find that universal acceptance is actually at the intersection of these two lenses. So those, um, I think, uh, form the basis for, for how governments and why governments ought to look at universal acceptance as the lever to, to move inclusion and to, and to bring uh, people online in a much easier way. Uh, just a couple of other things uh, that I wanted to also mention in, in my time. Um, 2001, um, in, in October of 2001, I launched .info in the company that I work at. And that was the first time, really, that this universal acceptance issue um, reared its, its head. And uh, from there on, you know, in, in 2002 or 2003, um, I, I helped, you know, create kind of three rules, um, round rules, if you will, of TLD acceptance. Uh, and at that time, it was an old TLD will be accepted more often than a new TLD. Um, the second rule was an ASCII-only TLD will be accepted more often than an IDN TLD. The third rule was a two or three letter TLD will be accepted more often than a longer CCTLD or GTLD. Now that, those were rules I crafted in 2002. It's a pity that here we are in 2019 and those rules still stay the course. I would love for those rules to, to be um, no longer true. But there is a role that governments have, I think, to play in changing those rules. Finally, there was a question that came online um, about um, my estimate or uh, what we think might be the estimate for full integration uh, of EAI, uh, an acceptance of uh, internationalized email addresses in registration forms on the web uh, and on the internet and you know, how long uh, do I estimate it might take? And I think that's, a, that's really set up for an overnight success on the internet. So there's probably 10 years. Thank you so much, Ram. Um, and so uh, uh, now we're actually going to turn to somebody who works on these issues uh, within our host country government, the German government. Here we have Constanza um, from the Ministry of the Interior who will provide us uh, with a, a presentation and she does have some slides. So if I could ask that uh, Constanza's slides are, are shown. Hello, everyone. I, first of all, I want to welcome you all here in this room and to this session and also to, to Berlin. And we are, uh, we are really happy to have you here all and um, to host this IGF. And 
we hope you enjoy the time and you have many good discussions go forward and we are here and we will support you thank you thank you for the invitation to this real um, interesting session um, I want to give you a short view in our IT infrastructure and DNS is an important brick and also the universal acceptance and I can agree to Ram, um, public administration has an important role to bring this theme or topic forward. Um, first of all, digitization of the public administration in Germany is an important topic of this political legislation period. Um, all layers and much more are involved in this topic because we have not only to handle the universal acceptance, we have to have a look at the human resources, to contracts and procurement, to IT services, applications, business applications, and the core infrastructure, and the layer upper and down three. It's very important to, to have this view also. We set up in the public administration a digitization program. We want to have online and to support every public administration to be online with services and offices until 2022. The joint portal network bundles the access to several different portals into a single access platform. And we can um, sign out the first step to grant universal acceptance. Our IT service provider of the federal government supports Punicode domains and UDF-8 for Unicode characters. So our DE NIC supports and provides the IDN and we discuss all these topics around universal acceptance. This program, based on the public administration information network, because networks, network infrastructures are essential for the public administration, we need strong security and high availability for all use levels. In the moment, we are going to consolidate our networks to respond to the threat level to prevent future attacks and to create transparency and reduce complexity. Which, um, we have to ensure that these infrastructures all support also this issue of universal acceptance. Federal IT infrastructure supports the topic in the DNS, in web servers, in proxy servers, in our server systems, firewalls. Special character domains are hardly used. Nevertheless, we have something like Kindertagesstätte or the character SZ we have to handle with. Domain names of the public administration usually are based on abbreviations. Special character domains are, however, fully supported by the existing infrastructure. But, I have to be honest, the municipalities are not already granted um, this, this infrastructure. It's a, it's a way forward and we are going step by step. Let me add some uh, additional facts. The DNS issues have, there are some, some more strategic um, uh, issues with DNS we have to handle it in Germany. So we have to discuss the digital sovereignty um, in the case of upcoming DOH. That's, uh, real huge discussion um, about the cross-border information leakage and 
the kind of business case with new age data coming up. The next relevant topic is to, to strengthen the online reputation of public administration IT services. For instance, we do this um, with DNSSEC. In the end of all, public administration have to take over responsibility for their own DNS infrastructure and, in my opinion, we have to, um, to take over the responsibility for the whole DNS system from our perspective. Thank you for your attention and please offer. Thank you so much, Constanza, um, uh, for giving us the state of affairs of uh, Germany's federal IT infrastructure, including how it supports universal acceptance. And I'm sure that there will be, there could be a lot of questions for you. Um, uh, but we might uh, just, for the time being, in the interest of time, uh, power on and go to a different part of the world. And um, so we'll have Edmund uh, Chung discuss Dot Asia's work in approaching different governments and explaining and promoting universal acceptance. Please, Edmund. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for having me here, Edmund Chung here. Um, so actually building on what Ram and, and others have, have said, um, the gov government part is, is quite important in terms of pushing out universal acceptance. I, I'll come back to that a little bit, but first on the, the situation in Asia, um, many countries um, uh, actually use uh, characters and use scripts that are not uh, uh, not the U.S. ASCII or Latin-based, and therefore it is very relevant for, for, for the country and for the citizens within the country to be able to reflect their own name. Uh, even going to, to primary, secondary school, you would uh, often you know, uh, have your name, and if that cannot be used in their email address, then that presents an interesting situation. Um, but. I, I, I guess some of the uh, uh, governments, for example, in China, in, in, in Thailand, in India, has been uh, pioneers in, in, the, in, in the field uh, in terms of in Asia especially, uh, and embracing the, the IDN, uh, uh, the internationalized domain names and internationalized email addresses. But I really want to spend my time here a little bit um, uh, maybe sharing some of the experience about reaching out to governments and what have worked or you know, what haven't worked so, so well um, and maybe that, that, that could help us uh, uh, build further. One interesting thing is that um, in the past, we've always, uh, the community and also uh, many, many who have been working on UA have focused a little bit more on top down, uh, trying to get to the decision makers, trying to get to uh, those who can make uh, influence decisions. Uh, over the years, I've, I've now come to realize that top down and bottom up is actually quite important. Um, and, and a broad based outreach is actually useful because ultimately, um, uh, decision makers can can jam this down the, the process, but when the when the developers haven 't even heard of uh, uh, internationalized email addresses then then it presents a challenge even getting through uh, to the actual implementation so uh, I think reaching out to government internal developers, webmasters, government uh, uh, IT de departments are actually equally important. So we, we have been somewhat overly cautious in the, in, in the past, I think, in terms of outreach, worried about protocols, worried about stepping over others. Um, and I think from, from our experience, actually reaching the, uh, the developer within an IT uh, 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 department in government, actually people feel more appreciative of um, knowing it, uh, uh, even if they then bring it up to their boss uh, and their boss didn't know about it or their boss heard about it but wasn't sure whether their team uh, was ready for it, they appreciate, uh, they actually appreciate much more than, than be dismissive. So. One thing, another thing that um, I think is important to note is that this is, as, as I think Ram and others have mentioned, it's not really about selling more domain names and we need to make sure um, it is, isn't really uh, positioned that way. It is really about making the internet's core address system embrace multicultural, multilingual uh, community for, for, for which this global internet now serves. So, and, and one of the 
key aspects that I, I personally find, and various people have talked about uh, the, the importance of marketing, I see it slightly differently. I think right now we are looking at a classic case of market failure. Because of the need of diverse actors across the supply side for readiness to, to, to actually contribute to the ability to, to fully reveal the latent demand, we have a market failure here. Um, the supply side is, is saying that there is no demand and therefore we're not preparing our systems to be ready. And the demand side doesn't even see the, the system because they can't use it and therefore it doesn't create the demand. And that calls for market intervention. Um, and I think, this is, I think this is what's happening. So more marketing actually you know, is, is not gonna work if there is a market failure. And that's why we need market intervention. That's why we need governments. Um, a couple of things I will end with um, in terms of the, the experience. One thing that, that, that is quite important, as, as Ram actually mentioned also, is fitting it into existing programs that, that governments have, uh, whether it's about diversity, whether it's about inclusion. Um, it could also be about local content development. It could also be about the sustainable development goals, where it, it actually talks about cultural heritage and, and social and infrastructure development. Um, it also could be uh, many governments are developing upgrade incentives, uh, getting corporations, SMEs to upgrade their network, upgrade their infrastructure. If, if, you, if UA becomes part of that program, then, then it, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense and, and it makes it easier. The other thing that I found about governments is that they, they tend to have a, 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 it's important for them to have a long-term view. It's, it needs to be into roadmaps, strategic plans that are maybe a couple years out, a few years out, um, maybe especially in, in, in Asia, um, many years. And, and that comes into play also with, with the procurement and tendering process, uh, having these terms in, in the government procurement process is, is very important, not only for the awareness within the government uh, uh, departments, but also to system integrators, to developers in that uh, locality. So finally, I think, um, I, I guess I call upon, I've been calling upon uh, the, the community for a long time, to drink our own Kool-Aid. I mean, we ourselves, uh, as the internet governance community, whether it's the whether it's ICANN, whether it's the DNS community, whether it's the civil society, we need to use more of these uh, new top level domains and use these IDNs. ICANN should not just use ICANN.org. It should use the, the equivalent in Cyrillic, in Chinese, in Arabic, in those languages, domain names for uh, for their URLs, for their email addresses, and we should do that too. Uh, we're working on it. We are, you know, at Dot Asia, we're not fully ready for it yet. We know that, but we ourselves need to do it. And this is another part that I think, uh, when we talk to government, would be very interesting. And this came out of a discussion in China uh, a, a few months ago. Closed environments may actually be the best uh, environment to get uh, email address internationalization uh, up and running, whether it's within the government, within universities, within primary schools, secondary schools, many students with their names, as I mentioned, in their local language, sending their homework back to the school. That is an environment that might get things started. Um, and so ourselves, um, closed environments, fitting into government, uh, 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 um, fit, fitting into government programs themselves and also go broad based and not just top down. I think those are some of the summary of uh, our experience for pushing UA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edmund. And as I understand it, in terms of the bottom up approach, um, sometimes it's helpful just to simply submit a bug report um, to your IT office, to, and that's a very good way to get people to pay attention um, to the issue. Uh, so we're, uh, we have about 17 minutes left, um, and we want to make sure to save time for, for questions and comments and discussion. Um, so we'll have our last key speaker uh, present, um, and this is Dr. Data. Um, and we have five minutes, and there he is. Hello, Jay. Hello. Great to participate uh, way far from there in India. 
I could not join you. Sorry for that. Some visa issues. I had very less time after I came from ICANN 66. So uh, I think uh, Edmund has spoken very well about the uh, UA issues. But let me tell you a little bit about uh, what in India happening related to the acceptance of IDNs and EAIs. So government of Rajasthan in the state uh, I participate and my businesses, they have taken a large step to provide an email address to every citizen of the state. We are 70 million people. Almost 6 million citizens have taken an email address. It's a large step. Even UASG group has actually awarded as a thought leader to the chief minister of the state. And this is a huge leadership from the government, which I want to convey uh, through this platform that all the governments all over the world can learn. And there's a case study by UASG on this, can learn and implement, break the language barrier and bring people online who do not speak English. Those people who have an issue and participating in the internet and utilize the power as good as we all can, everybody else who do not speak English can enjoy the power of internet. Another thing which governments can do is implement the procurement policy for the technologies and the softwares they are looking for. So if government in future buy out any software or maybe from as a product or as a service, government can amend their procurement policy and follow the recommended guidelines by UASG so that they, these people can acquire a UA-ready software or UA-ready service so that the service allows people to accept an ID and an EAI and government is forward-looking. Government do not reject the email addresses which citizens acquire otherwise as a valid email address. Third thing is about awareness. I think uh, Edmund spoke about it. I will not repeat that. However, we are lacking into creating a demand. So the moment government start adopting these email addresses and provide them free, we sort of create a demand. And this demand allows vendors to modify their softwares to be UA ready because they need to now serve to the government or they need to serve those identities or those email addresses which are provided by the government to the citizens. So it kind of becomes a very big push by governments to uh, support the UA. I am glad that there is a survey which is being done and uh, even the GAC has uh, pushed it forward for the DCD NSI so that we know now what governments are thinking and how government can be pushed together in this area. Another thing which uh, we all should know, GAC has taken and uh, through the ICANN uh, meeting in ICANN 66, we are now having a UA working group in GAC, which means now in future, we are going to have more closer co coordination and we are likely to have many, many governments accepting the IDNs and EAIs in their daily working of life and offering those services which are UA and EAI ready. Another thing which we all need to do is accept an IDN and EI in our own working. Like Edmund said that they are working in their own setup. ICANN is getting ready to be UA and EI ready. We heard an IT team about this at all. What we need to now do is all the people who are now working in UA and passionate about bringing next billion people online, I guess we all need to become the torch bearer, walk the talk, what we are doing here, and really start doing small things maybe into our own organizations so that we are ready to demonstrate how easy it is to become UA ready. Or even if it is there are some difficulties, we can solve them together to be UA ready. In Universal Acceptance Steering Group, we have now a dedicated tech working group. We are now having a dedicated communications working group. So if you are interested to have a solution related to a particular problem you are facing with, please pass it on to a UA tech working group, send it to us. We will be happy to look at it and come back with a solution to you definitely. If you are looking for a document to spread awareness or resolve a particular issue, the comms group can look at it and provide a presentation or a document to you 
and very quickly and appropriate document which can really help. Easy to understand, easy to uh, take up for the solutions. Another thing which uh, I want to tell at the end is there are enough documents created by UA Working Group. There are these documents are available on uasg.tech website. Please visit that website, participate in the discussions we have. There are links available. There is a link available to even to join a working group. And there's a link available to all the documents which have been created in last four years. These documents are great resource available completely free of cost on which millions of dollars have been spent. These documents are a great help to kick off, kick start the initiative within your organization for UA and even understand at a basic what UA can do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dada, for joining us and um, for providing that information uh, so people know how to join UASG. Uh, so now let's take some uh, time for questions and comments. Mark, please. Thank you. This is Mark Daresgaard speaking from Governance Primer. I am a UA ambassador, and I would like to bring to everybody's attention a study that has been mentioned here a few times. Um, I urge you all to look up on your favorite search engine for UASG025. Um, the website is being redesigned, and I swear that by next year I won't have to do it this way. <laughs> I'll just be able to point you to it, but please have a look. This is a study that was commissioned by the UA and my team led its development. It was a interesting work we did with some very young people from the youth programs. One of them is here, Savio, thank you for your support. And we have some interesting results that I would like to share with the table. I did promise last year that we would do this. So for new short domains or acceptances on the web, we're not talking server side here, we're talking web stands at 97%, which I would say is pretty decent. But the moment you look at new long domains, and by this we mean anything that's five characters or anything beyond that, that's 84%. So it starts to look not that good. And the moment you go down to IDNs, that's 50%. So it's a very steep decrease, and it only looks worse the farther we go down in terms of complexity, all the way to uh, right to left, in which we have 7% acceptance. So as you can see, we are pretty far ahead in terms of accepting new short domains, so dots, three letters. Um, but from there, it's a bit of a race to the bottom, and this shows just how much we really need to get working. So if this is this level of acceptance on the web level, uh, for sure, on the server side, it's even lower. And one thing, one element that was brought up uh, previously is in relation to HTML5. And this is something that, considering the number of influencers we have in this room and on this group overall, this is a conversation we need to get started with the developers, uh, not only W3C, but also the maintainers of HTML, which is a different group. Um, because right now, input type email, which is the default um, way to render a field in HTML to receive emails, uh, it's not compliant with anything but or third test case, which is a, uh, uh, that of IDNs. The moment you start with Unicode, it doesn't accept those emails. And the reason for that, according to the developers, is that you know the server might not, not expect we can't support it in this way because if you put it on the front end and the back end doesn't accept you create a problem but that's not much of a hard fix because we could have another uh, field we could have input type eai email for example so anybody who's ready has a very simple html5 way to do it so it's not that complicated it's more a matter of politics and talking to them and convincing them of the point, then exactly it being a very difficult situation. And the moment we get solved this on the web level, we already tick one box completely. We get that off our heads pretty much forever, and when we have 100% compliance, maybe that can be merged back and become just input type email, and we're done with the website of the equation. So I urge anybody who has contacts within that side of the fence to get this conversation started next year 
and that we can move this ahead and perhaps this is the right venue to do it. I don't know, I'm just, this is one of our key conclusions of things that we can improve in the short term. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm sorry to uh, cut you off. We just we have very little time remaining, but I appreciate those comments. So we'll just do. Please, um, if you could just uh, be very brief, maybe a minute or less. Um, we'll go to the gentleman next to Mark, and then to uh, our our youth <laughs> participant, and then um, we will wrap up comments uh, with Chris. And then I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, uh, Melinda, to share uh, briefly some results of um, our survey. And I might actually have to run because I have to go to a session. Um, so you might have to <laughs> wrap up for us. Um, uh, but please, sir. Thank you, uh, and Andrew Campling of uh, 419 Doc Consulting. So firstly, thank you to those people that uh, enabled longer uh, domain names. That was much appreciated uh, uh, for me personally. Um, just briefly, um, I would find it tremendously helpful if uh, maybe I can created a site where I could register any sites which didn't uh, accept maybe longer domain names or indeed uh, uh, those with non-ASCII characters so that a, an information uh, uh, set was sent to the uh, registered owner of the site to give them information on why it would be a good thing for them to amend their site to accept uh, sort of different domain names. Um, I think coming from ICANN, that would be seen as quite neutral and helpful uh, for the site owners. Um, and as I say, just be able to go to a, a, a page, input a, a, a domain name, and then leave that to, to ICANN to, to reach out to them would be a, a, a useful tool. Uh, hello. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Savi. I'm from the youth program of the Brazilian uh, steering group, Internet Steering Group, and uh, I would like to to talk a little more about the technical community opinion about universal acceptance. I've come in talking uh, with some people that uh, develops codes and uh, are systems administrators, and uh, the feel the feeling of this this community is that actually uh, they are not really convinced about uh, universal acceptance. And in some cases, like in the uh, HTML, uh, HTML5 uh, discussions about email addresses, uh, international, internationalization, uh, if you read the forums, discussions, and something like that, they are really uh, scared uh, with the possibility of the, of the websites uh, like Crack like stopped working uh, if it, uh, the, the tag on HTML5 start uh, accepting uh, uh, international EAI. So the idea uh, is maybe take some approach with the the, the, the technical community uh, to convince the, the to do do not do the opposite work. Uh, and be, get convinced of the importance of universal acceptance. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're going to go to Chris, and uh, then I'm going to um, go to Melinda, and then perhaps if there's some more discussion afterwards, you'd like to moderate that. Uh, Chris, please. Thank you. Um, I, I want to talk about passion, and I'm, gonna, I'm talking entirely personally here. Um, it was passion that set the CCTLD community off on the start of the IDN fast track, and it was passion that drove that through as quickly as, as it did. Um, there's a 1989 movie called Field of Dreams. Some of you will know it, some of you won't, but basically it's about a guy who builds a baseball diamond in the middle of a field, uh, because if he builds it, they will come, and they are the baseball players and the audience. And it feels to me as if we've built the baseball diamond, but the gates are still locked, and not only can the players not get in, but neither can the audience. Um, we talk about marketing and say that it's all about the demand from the audience and once they're there, that's not right. It's actually about us having built it, opening the gates, and then they will come. And it feels to me as if we've, got a, we've reached the point where we've got, the, we've got it built, but the gates are still locked. And it cannot be beyond the wit of the people around this table 
to fix that. We are, we, we're, we're on the infrastructure, we're governments, we're businesses who make an awful lot of money out of this internet thing. And if between us we cannot influence everybody who needs to fix this to fix this, it's, it would be an extraordinary thing. We have, we built it, we made IDNs, we made new D GTLDs. Surely we can fix, I don't know how, but I do know that one thing that isn't gonna work is simply coming back here year after year and talking about it. We actually need to do something. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. I couldn't have asked for a more perfect segue into our closing comments. The, one of our goals this year was to conduct a survey that was meant to give us a little more insight into the challenges that the public sector faces, both in terms of awareness and how we need to position things. Unfortunately, we were not able to get funding. Uh, we might potentially get that next year. I'm not giving up hope. But what we did was launch a pilot uh, survey. Uh, this, as well as the rest of the slides we had today, we'll, we'll send out to our mailing list. If you're not on it, just let one of us know. Um, I won't take you through all of this today. I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights. Uh, one of the reasons to do this pilot uh, was, first and foremost, to define what our target audience is. Um, attempt to define the hypotheses that we are testing, and then understand who this network is. How do we actually reach that target audience of, of respondents? All of this then will inform uh, the survey that I am intended to, to get funded uh, next year. Um, the data set was too small to be uh, incredibly relevant, but it did highlight a couple of things uh, that brings us back to a couple of comments. Um, the two things I want to highlight that we included as the target audience um, individuals who are what we called influencers, um, that they would have some ability 